Jim brought me a new sign Thursday night. Amen. So, just in case you get quiet out there. I learned that from Pastor Dennis. Huh? Yeah. Well, it's Pentecostal Sunday. What a day. Last year, I don't know, it slipped by me. I didn't even know it was Pentecostal Sunday until somebody said afterwards, hey, you know, it's Pentecostal Sunday. Oh, I don't know, I didn't know. So, I don't know, but this year, been thinking about it. I feel like the Lord's been working on me all week on this. So I want to talk a little bit about it. Pentecost means 50. It's not a real spiritual name. 50. So instead of calling them Pentecostal churches, you could call them 50 churches. Or the 50th. Or something. It's a Greek word. It means 50. So it's named after the Jewish Feast of Weeks. They call it the Feast of Weeks. The Greek word for it is Pentecost, 50 days. Well, they start at Passover. There are three main feasts in the Jewish calendar. Passover and the week following that of unleavened bread. And Pentecost. And then in the fall they have the group of feasts with the Day of Atonement and Rosh Hashanah and, and the uh, Feast of uh, Booths. So it was a Jewish feast day and people from all over the world, known world, were in Jerusalem that day. Crowded, busy, big day. In Leviticus 23, verse 15, it says on that day, and there's talking about the day after the Sabbath. That's a Sunday. We, we kind of confuse those words. We talked about it a few weeks ago. We think Sabbath, we think Sunday. Well, no, Sabbath is Sabbath. And so, on that day, after the Sabbath, in parentheses, on the Sunday, On that first fruits, he is to wave a sheaf of new grain. <clears throat> you know how in the early spring, a little bit of fescue will pop up a little flag, and on there will be some grains of seed, but it's green. You can't take it and plant it because it's not mature yet. And not all of them are doing that, but just a few pop up. Well, that's what this is about. So the day, this is a day or two after Passover, Passover is usually in April. And so the wheat does the same thing. He'll send up, a few of them will send up a little flag with a few green seeds on it. Everything's still green. It's not yellow and golden like wheat is when it's ready to harvest. And so the priest would take that and wave that as an offering, a wave offering to the Lord. So Passover, and usually then there'd be a week of unleavened bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And during that week, there would be a Sabbath. So Jesus was crucified on Passover. He's the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. He is the Passover Lamb. And by His blood, our sins are forgiven. They're washed away. We're covered by His blood, just like the blood covered the doorposts during that first Passover and the death angel passed over them. So in that particular week, it's the 14th day of the first month, so it can fall on any day of the week. In that week, it started Thursday evening. The Jewish days start at sundown and go to the next Sunday. So Passover started sundown on Thursday. They ate the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, with the disciples that Thursday night. And on Friday, still on Passover, he was crucified, buried and left alone on Saturday the Sabbath. But on the day after Sabbath, the first fruits, he rose from the dead, the first one born from the dead. He was the first fruit of the resurrection of the dead. He is the first one born from the dead. 
And so now, seven weeks later, that's how they counted it. They said from that Sabbath, on that week, after Passover, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven weeks from that Sabbath, and one day. So it brings us to Pentecost, 50 days, seven weeks plus one. And that day would be the first day after the Sabbath, a Sunday. Or some people, some of them say the eighth day, which means Sunday the day after the Sabbath. And so it's why we, why Christians meet on Sunday. The Lord was raised from the dead on Sunday. The Holy Spirit came on Sunday. And so over the years, they've kind of transposed those words and called Sunday the Sabbath. Well, it's not, not according to the Bible. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of difference, but it's, if you're reading through here, you're thinking, reading about the Sabbath, and you're thinking it's Sunday, well, it'll confuse you. So just keep Sabbath on Saturday and Sunday the Lord's Day. So here he is, the day of Pentecost. So it's 10 days. This particular Pentecost is 10 days after Jesus ascended in their sight, in the, decided, in the sight of the disciples into heaven. And now, on this day, there's going to be another harvest. It's a harvest festival. Now the priest on Pentecost is to we wave a sheaf of, part of mature grain. It'll be golden and yellow. The heads will be full of grain. And he'll wave that before the Lord. And in fact, you can make bread out of that. It's mature now. So they also bring loaves of bread and they wave a sheaf of new grain because it's the harvest of the 50-day Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. And so that's what they were doing. That's what was going on in Jerusalem that day. And there were the disciples, the group of them, 120 of them now, gathered in an upper room. Well, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus, before he went up, on that day, maybe that he went up, he said, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have, your, you have heard me speak about. You know, before he was crucified, he said, You know, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be tried, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be buried, I'm going to raise again. And they, they never heard it, they never got it. And when it happened, they were devastated. Until he rose from the dead and came back and was like, duh, I told you. And so they began to go, oh, yeah, we remember that. So now he's given them another promise. He says, wait, Jerusalem, wait for the gift my father <coughs> promised, which you have heard me speak about. Let me just remind you that you weren't listening before, but maybe you'll listen now. I'm going to, this is a gift that I've told you about. You heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They didn't know what that meant. Most of us today don't know what that means in some ways. But they went, oh, okay. They wanted to know about the end times. He says in verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or days. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and in the ends of the earth. So they were in the upper room, praying, all together in one accord. Ten days, they were up there. And the power fell that morning. Why Pentecost? Why the baptism of the Spirit? It was for power to preach the gospel. It was for power to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. Why? That's why. For evangelism. You can call the Holy Spirit the spirit of evangelism. It is his main goal is to get the gospel to every creature under heaven. 
God doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And the Holy Spirit's job through the church, us, is to spread the message, spread the gospel. That's why we did it. They had power. Was it only for that day to start the church? Or does it need to be for today also? Maybe now in these last times. Do we need people to stand up in those riots and claim the name of Jesus and push back the darkness and declare the glory of God? Maybe we need the power even more today. Maybe we need the baptism of the Spirit even more than they did in that early church. Well, there they were, minding their own business. <coughs> no, they weren't. They were praying. When the day, chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost, that just means the feast. When the day, the 50th day, came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were staying. Wow. So dramatic. So overwhelming. The sound of a freight train. The sound of a tornado. The sound of a violent wind. The wind didn't blow them away. But the sound was there. A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each of them. They saw each other under tongues of fire, wind and fire. Those are marks of the Holy Spirit. Those are the signature of God. You see, the disciples needed to know that this second promise was fulfilled. A dramatic entrance of the Holy Spirit. Wind and fire. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages or tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What a dramatic thing. What an unheard of thing. And the other miracle was, there were people there from all over the world. And they heard them speaking in their own language. People from Greece and Rome and Africa and Asia. And they heard their language. One of them speaking their language. Praising God. And I don't know what they were doing. I expect they were weaving a little bit. They thought they were drunk. They said, the guy, these guys are drunk. No. Wind and fire. When God called Moses, he drew him to a burning bush that was burning but not consumed. He said, take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. When Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to a contest of offerings, to be answered by fire. No God came to their fire. No God came to their sacrifice. No Baal showed up. But the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob answered Elijah and burned up the bull that he had cut up, the wood, the water he had poured on it, and the dirt all around it, consumed it in a moment, in a second. He answered with fire. And the Israelites had left Egypt and were at the Red Sea. Pharaoh changed his mind and came after him. And here they were, the Red Sea in front of them, Pharaoh behind them. I think it's where we got the phrase, the devil in the deep blue sea. They had no place to go. The angel of the Lord came and stood behind them in a pillar of fire and kept Pharaoh back. At God's command, Moses took his staff and his hand over the water, and God separated the water with a strong east wind. And the Israelites walked over on dry ground. When the Pharaoh and the Egyptians tried to follow. God told him, stretch out your hand again. And the sea closed over them, killed them all. In 2 Samuel 22, 11, David, talking about God, says he mounted the cherubim, that's an angel, he mounted the cherubim and flew. 
He soared on the wings of the wind. The wind. All Jerusalem heard them. All Jerusalem was turned upside down. Peter stood and said, said to them, a huge crowd had developed and come around to where they were. He said, they aren't, they aren't drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. They're not drunk as you suppose. But this is what the prophet Joel predicted. And you can read it in chapter 2, verse 17. In the last days, God says, we're in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all people. All people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Spirit filling him because of the power that was energizing him. He and the 120 stood there before this crowd of Jerusalem, the same crowd that had crucified Jesus only 50 days ago. And he had the power to say to them, God has made this Jesus you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Christ says in Acts, Greek word for Messiah. They were cut to the quick. And they said, what must we do? He said, repent and believe in the name of Jesus and be baptized. And this gift is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord may call. This gift is for you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people were brought into the kingdom that day. First fruits. What a harvest. It was a harvest day. 3,000. That's quite a service. Praise the Lord. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for all believers. You just ask Him. You ask Him for it. To baptize you and He will. The Holy Spirit comes into you when you're saved. The Holy Spirit is in you. If you're a believer in Jesus and born again, the Holy Spirit is in you. And He will never leave you. Ever. He is in you. But when you're baptized in the Spirit, it seems to be a second event. Many people say it's not. Many people say it's all one. But if you read the book of Acts with an open mind, I think you'll conclude that it's a separate act. To be baptized in the Spirit doesn't mean you are more or less of a believer. Doesn't mean you're more or less righteous. It doesn't mean you're more or less mature in the Lord. It has nothing to do with those things. It has to do that you come to Him and seek what He has for you. All that He has for you. There is more. There is more. To walk in the power of God, to be guided by the Spirit, taught by the Spirit, to reveal the truth of Jesus. In John 4, He talked to the woman at the well. He said, I have living water. And anybody who drinks this water will have a spring of water inside of him. A spring of living water welling up 
to eternal life. And that's true. When you come to Jesus, the Spirit comes in and it's a well of living water that springs up to eternal life. Your name is written in heaven. You're saved. You're on your way to heaven. But just three chapters later, chapter 7, It says, come to me, I have the living water. Those who believe in me will have streams of living water flowing out of their innermost being. Streams. Not just one, many. I don't know if you've ever been to where a river starts. One time we were in Colorado and you can go to where the Arkansas River starts. And it's not one spring. It's many springs. And it comes out of the mountain. Where does that water come from? Up on the side of the mountain. It wells up somehow. And there was a little, little ring of water coming over here, not even a ditch, just some water coming down the side of the mountain over there, here and there and there. And you could walk across them. But pretty soon it turned into a river. Springs of living water. Streams, there's more. There's more. Verse 39, it says, After that time, the Spirit had not been given. It was before he had died and gone to, gone to heaven. John 15, 26, he says, But when the Comforter has come, that's the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. His job is evangelism. His job is to glorify Jesus and reveal the truth of Jesus. Verse, chapter 16, verse 13, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. The Holy Spirit never glorifies himself, but Jesus. But what he hears, he shall speak. He shall show you things to come. We need the Spirit. We need all the Spirit we can get. John 14, 15 through 17. He's with you. He'll be in you. And you know Him. Or people say, well, I don't, I don't really know Him. The Bible says you do. If you're a born again believer, you know him and you hear his voice. If you listen, you got to turn your voice to him. In John 20, verse 22, after the resurrection, Jesus showed up in their locked room. The doors were locked, but he showed up. And one of the things he said to them was, Receive the Holy Spirit implying that they were born again at that moment. But he said to them, wait in Jerusalem until you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. There seems to be two things. There's more for you. Do you have to be baptized in the Spirit? No. Do you have to speak in tongues? No. Do you have to have a heater in your house? No. But wouldn't you like one? Do you have to have air conditioning in your house? No. But you can. You can have it. Would you like to have a car? Or do you want to go in a buggy? You can have a car. God wants to bless you. There's nothing mysterious. There's nothing scary about any of this. The devil tries to tell you that. The lies out there are, oh, stay away from that. That's weird. That's scary. Those are lies from the pit of hell. God wants to bless you. Jesus said, which of you, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? He said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? We just have to ask Let me tell you a little story about myself. I'm about to quit here. Um, 
going to college, learning about biology. I was in love with biology, DNA, molecular biology. It was so fascinating to me. Chemistry, physics, math, all those things. I was learning all these things, but there were undercurrents at the university about evolution, about survival of the fittest and a bunch of other nonsense. And it was seductive because all the professors talked like that and they sneered at religion and belief in God and the Bible. And I thought, that didn't quite make sense. They made it sound like that as the Bible approached the truth of science, that part of the Bible could be true. Problem was, there's not much truth in science, as we've learned the last few weeks. It changes from day to day. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Stay away, get close, go to school, don't go to school. Science changes because it's man's knowledge. It's man's wisdom. It's man's conclusions. And they change. I've said this before. I don't do anything in surgery today like I did when I was trained. I don't do anything that they trained me to do like I did then. It is all different. Science changes. Science is just man's thoughts and conclusions. And the other thing is that scientists lie because they're human. They lie, they cheat, they steal, just like every other human on the planet. So truth of science, a little salt on that. Maybe a lot of salt on that. But God's word, this is true. This is the rock on which we stand. This is forever true. It's a miracle that the Holy Spirit moved people to write this book in so many different centuries, so many different people, and got it exactly the way he wants it. And people say, well, you know, there's different translations and they're different, but every one is the Word of God. That's another miracle. Even now, when a new translation comes out, it's the Word of God, and it's exactly what the Holy Spirit wants it to say. You can trust this book. This is the truth. And as science approaches the Bible, some of it may be true. You know, gravity, you throw something off, it falls. That's, that's mostly true. Unless you're God. And then you get on a cherubim and you fly on the wings of the wind. Unless you're Jesus and you walk on water. Feed the 5,000. Yeah, it's mostly true. But the Word of God is true. And when I decided that and settled that in my heart, that this is true, I'm going to learn all I can about this other. But this is the truth. And this had to come up. Science had to come up to the Bible. And then I began reading it in earnest. If you've not read the Bible from cover to cover, you need to. Most believers in the world don't have a Bible. They don't have access to a Bible. They've got a little piece of paper with a few scriptures on it. Some places, they have a scrap, and they tear it up and give it to different people so that the authorities can't get it and burn it up. And your job is to memorize that piece you have in case somebody takes it from you. And so when you get together, you say, Brother John, give us some Ephesians. And he quotes the book to you. We're lazy. We don't have a hunger for the Word of God. One of the most important things that happens in the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a hunger for the Word of God. Oh, there's more. When I started reading it, I wanted all of it. I grew up Southern Baptist. They told me that stuff was just for those days. Well, that healing stuff went away. That power went away. That prophecy stuff, that's, oh, stay away from that, that's weird. It was just for those days. It didn't say that. It didn't say that anywhere. I wanted all of it. And also at the university, <laughs> the Jesus movement came through town. A bunch of hippies. Man, they were praising God and worshiping God and speaking in tongues. 
Yikes. We used to, from the Baptist Student Union, some of us, Brother Hayden was preaching at Sheridan Assembly, I think, that's where it was. And we got a car load and went, and somebody knew how to get in the back, and we went and looked on back from behind the stage and saw him touching people, people going boom, 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 falling down. And we thought, let's get out of here. <laughs> it's a little scary. It's a little scary if you don't have knowledge. It took a few years. We kept wanting it. We moved to Oklahoma City. We married by then. We went to med school. Our neighbor, very sweet lady, but very crazy. I mean, in a good way. In a good way. She had about 10 chihuahuas. I never did make up with them. Every time we'd come in, they'd run up and down the fence on her side. I didn't make up. So, <laughs> sweet lady. She kept, they were having a revival at her church in South Oklahoma City. South Oklahoma City is not the good part of Oklahoma City. This, I'm not talking about more, I'm talking about just south of I 40. It, it's kind of a, at that time anyway, it's kind of a run down area. Little, little church there, revival, and she begged us over and over and over to go. And finally, we said, okay, let's go. We got there, it was an evening service. Little white frame building. We went in the door and there were a lot of loud music going on, a lot of instruments, everybody playing. I don't think they were playing the same song. And I don't think anything was in kind of in tune. I'm not, I don't have a great musical ear, but you can kind of tell when it's like, mm. And they were all singing real loud, a lot of tambourines, a lot of movement, a lot of dancing. And you could put the whole building inside our little eating area right there. And then, did I say this other thing? A lady preacher did say. I said, oh, a lady preacher. But back then, it was a little weird for me. She started talking about the Holy Spirit. About the power of God. And she said, any of you who want to be baptized in the Spirit, get up and come down here. We looked at each other, and we got up and went down. And they prayed for us and on us. A lot of, a lot of spit. <laughs> a lot of hands. I mean, it was the old time stuff. Nothing dramatic happened. But I remember that time. It's great peace. But over the next few days and months, it grew in us. And we began to see the fullness and the glory of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Do you have to speak in tongues? No. But the Bible says when you speak in tongues, you speak directly to God. And you speak mysteries. And it builds yourself up in the Holy Ghost. Do you have to eat breakfast? No. But you can. It's right here. I argue with God about this. So I don't want to talk about this. So you talk about that. And so I'm going to tell you what he told me to tell you. If you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, get up and come down here, and we're going to pray with you. We need a song, Eve. I'm not going to do any more pleading than that. You don't have to have breakfast, but it's here. Come, and we'll pray for you. We'll pray with you. We'll stand in the gap with you. God wants to give you. Oh, he's God. Thank you.